So I'm Julian Kindred, a producer, engineer, a songwriter. I've been recording in and out of studios for uh, just a little under 30 years now. Uh, I'm from Canada originally. Uh, my career began in Nashville, Tennessee. I was there for a, a, just a little over a decade, um, cutting my teeth on Music Row and in the whole infrastructure of that world and learning craft and that. Uh, somewhere around uh, 2002, I moved to, uh, to Southwest London, where we are here, Epsom. And we're here in my studio, which is an Nonsuch Park studio. Um, and it's a mixing room, a vaulted uh, live tracking room, uh, daylight. It's nice to have it filmed in some beautiful daylight today. I think just seems to be that most of the stuff that really just kind of uh, fired me up happened to be very rhythmic oriented music, you know. So I, you know, I was really into R&B and soul music at a young age, which is interesting because m like my mom, for instance, was very into like rock, you know, and British invasion rock and, and th things like that. My father was a little bit more into like um, a complement of rock, Beatles, uh, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye. My father was a little bit more all rounder, you know. And, uh, but yet I discovered things like, you know, Jamaica and reggae on my own, apart from their influence. Really start getting into Tony Allen and the music of West Africa and things like that, you know. And I don't know what it is. I just, it, just rhythm, anything with uh, really kinetic rhythm and, and that sort of thing really appealed to me. So we have the control room and then have the, uh, the live room. Um, and basically, uh, get a, a Ludwig 65 uh, kit in there. And it's reasonably treated and uh, a vaulted ceiling. You can get a pretty tight to large room size in there and all in between. And uh, a reasonable complement of uh, front end gear, um, which is just, you know, I can, with this here, there's some AMAC units, Vintec, which is essentially a 1081. Neve 1081, Distressors, Focusrite Producer Pack, going in through Avid Hardware into HDX and Pro Tools. But basically with this, I can, I can record, you know, um, the, the basic drum track and any overdub drum-wise and bass and probably a, a guitarist. So you can record functionally the, 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 um, the structured track of a, of a band on the way in, you know. Okay, so this is the drum room here in my studio, Nonsuch Park. Um, I'm going to quickly just give a basic rundown of um, kind of a bread and butter approach of how I do drum recording. Um, a lot of what I'm going to show is very similar to what a lot of other people would do. Um, probably the uh, varying ingredients is the engineer in, in uh, question in each uh, setting. Different guys are going to do different things with the exact same setup and um, uh, hopefully produce uh, results that reflects each individual involved and each performer involved. So I'm here with my friend Samson Jado, who's playing for us today. Um, he is a very versatile drummer, but I particularly love his uh, articulation and, and um, drive into really, really uh, funky, solid grooves. He's a very good groove based drummer and so anytime we're working together I'm usually trying to like really pronounce the presence and the articulation of the immediate um, uh, playing that he's doing. It's kind of, uh, we've not really done, not that I can remember, um, anything where we're going for a big wild bombastic sound where there's less definition of the articulate up front groove. We're tr usually trying to keep it pretty centered, pretty focused, pretty tight. Um, and that's at least what we're doing in this instance today. So, so fundamentally, um, is a pretty basic setup of uh, AKG 414s on the overheads. There is no specific uh, rule as to this being like any any specific position. Just apart from trying to get a, a solid stereo image while maintaining uh, equidistant relationship to the snare. Uh, 
for both mics. So I'm trying to get the global drum sound there, quite frankly. Uh, just the sense of capturing exactly what Samson's doing. So the majority of that is coming from me getting like, this is almost like, if you will, um, uh, a, a snapshot, or you like you're spying out the territory of the land. This is what the drummer is doing. This is how he performs. This is how he delivers nuance and variability and everything. You're trying to get the whole sonic picture there. So try to get that and try to make a balanced frequency range top to bottom so that it's um, reflecting what he's playing. And then once you've got that position, then we'll start incorporating uh, the other mics in and fundamentally the kick and the snare and just trying to make sure that they are uh, phase relevant to those mics. And the only way you can figure that out is just by listening. If it's out of phase, you'll hear it quickly. If you're trying to, as I did early in my career, try to figure it out by reading about it in a textbook, you're not, you're going to be um, uh, kind of, kind of racking your brain trying to figure out what it is because it's something you have to hear. So being in front of the speakers, if it's in phase or out of phase with other things, you will notice quickly whether there's like a comb filtering sound, a hollowing out and a thinning out of the sound. If you're losing all the 60 to 50 hertz bottom end energy of a kick drum against these, you're definitely not in the right phase position or phase relationship with these mics. So it requires listening. It requires uh, confidently trying things out. If you're not matched, you want to just move and jiggle mics a little bit so that things are happening correctly. Sometimes there's a face, you can use face switches on gear and everything, but you got to remember that that's 180 degree change. So sometimes a 180 degree change isn't the thing that you need to correct it. Sometimes what you need to do is just move it so that it's all relevant and that this kind of works most uh, times. Um, for well, I mean, it's it reliably works most times for it, but I'm usually still always just jiggling a little bit and everything depending on what's going on. But this is a pretty good, solid, dependable picture. This microphone, I will tend to um, do really dramatic things with like having it way in, in the far reaches of the vault of the room um, for a, a large, um, you know, Bonham esque type sound or that kind of thing whenever we're doing that, which is not. As, as already stated, not what Samson and I are doing today. But, um, it, you know, I'll have it in different positions, and sometimes I'll have two of them in different positions if I want a stereo. Uh, um, mic set up for rooms. Um, but in this instance, I want it to be something that is picking up an overall drum picture in mono, very similar to these, very similar in terms of distance from the kit, particularly the snare. And, um, yeah, in, in this uh, in this recording session today, we're just having it so that that can be used even independent, or not independent, but it as opposed to these. So you can mix them so that you don't even use these, or you can mix it so that you don't use these. Uh, I am doing something with this mic where I'm exaggerating compression a little bit more to affect taster's choice. Uh, just trying to drive it a little bit and trying to make it a little bit more characterful. Sometimes it'll be really dramatic with uh, this, despite it being a large diaphragm mic. A condenser mic will put it very close to the actual um, immediate kit snare uh, relationship so that um, it's really exaggerating and making compressors really, really work in ridiculous ways sometimes, depending on how characterful you want the recording to be. You know, if you want it more transparent, then you get to kind of ease off and um, back off and all that. Um, yeah, so that is, that's a flexible mic for me and sometimes not even used, quite frankly. It depends on Depends on what the song's doing, how the song goes. It's always about the song. Uh, the kick drum situation is a, the direct mic is a, an AKG D112, a newer version of the D12, which is also a really great mic, a little deeper than the D112 actually. A little bit more of a, I suppose, a, a vintage pickup in that, um, for, uh, despite not wanting to wear out that word. This is a really good mic for picking up the uh, the direct uh, thump of the kick. A lot of other great options out there as well. Um, and this is a customized um, speaker trick to get sub uh, pickup of the kick drum. The the um, it's a common thing everybody sees these days. Where there's some there's lots of branded versions of this. Uh, this one was done by a friend of mine, Paul Evans, another drummer. 
who uh, brought it to a session and I liked it so much I just asked him if I could buy it from him, which he graciously uh, was happy to take my money. Um, so yeah, so what you want to do with the two of these is just make sure that the phase relationship is intact as well, that they're picking up um, the delivery of the kick in the same way. If there's phase issues there, that'll be, this will not nearly do what you're wanting it to do in the first place. Phase is everything. In this so you're, when you think about drum recording is really you're recording one thing you're recording a, a drummer delivering their best really diving in it's one sound it's not trying to get a great snare drum sound although you want that it's not trying to get a great kick drum sound although you want that what you're trying to do is get a great drum sound and in fact choosing the right drums as any great drummer like sam and and others will know is that you know good choices per drum will make the other drum sound great Okay, uh, Sennheiser 421s, these are um, miking toms when you first start engineering. If you, I'll be honest about a trap that I fall, fell into where you're putting the, you're putting the mics like right under because you want to get like great signal to noise and isolation and no bleed and all this stuff. But it's, I used to go really ridiculous about that early days. But give a little bit of, um, um, headroom there for the um, the transients of the tom to breathe and everything. You can even do more than that. It's worth bringing up the fact that if all your mics in a good phase relationship with each other, then you will be worried about bleed and spill a lot less in the first place. Uh, you won't be worried too much about whether there's too much hi hat and snare and that sort of thing. The kind of things you worry about when you start out and and lose sleep over. But more finesse and all that, you know, you kind of get to the point where you're trying to capture, as I said a moment ago, just a great drum sound and make sure that bleed isn't affecting anything in a negative way. So yeah, so 421s on the toms, I, I like a lot. Sometimes I put U87s on the toms as well, if you want a little bit more throatier, meatier uh, pickup to do the same kind of thing, but just a different kind of mic. Uh, the hi-hat is a KM184 in this instance. Just off the hat a little bit to give Samson room to uh, um, articulate variation in the way he plays. Just leave room for uh, um, stabs and openings on the on the hat so that there's like a lot of breadth there. And then the snare is a just a basic SM57 on top, up close, but with some room for as I say air and variation in his playing. KM184. I'm keeping these two mics and those two mics on the kick separate in this instance because depending on what we do i don't know necessarily if i want to commit to a blend to them although i often do when i'm tracking uh what we're doing today i just want to have the variation and everything sometimes i won't use a bottom snare at all and uh sometimes i won't use the sub kick at all um on on the kick trim it totally depends on the results we've got and what the song is doing once again just everything dependent upon um the uh the the things that the song is asking to have done to it. Could you give me some kind of pattern again, but just give me toms like every two bars, maybe? Okay, in this example, I am going to use Soothe to show how a kick drum can be enhanced in terms of not only its sonic quality and its depth, and particularly the low end, uh, but also the articulation of the punch, but also how some um, less than desirable mid-range frequencies can be harnessed and toned down. This is a reasonable uh, recording that we've just done, so I'm very happy with it as it is, but even in this instance, it will highlight uh, some ways in which it can just be finessed 
and enhance that much more to um, uh, a pleasing effect. Here goes. Okay, now I'm going to use Soothe to tame a hi-hat, not only in the low frequency, particularly where there's been bleed or spill on the mic, but also in some of the upper frequencies that might need to be tamed. This recording, once again, I'm quite happy with on its own, but I will just over-exaggerate just to show what is possible with Soothe and just the extremes to which you can harness and really finesse and make uh, specific frequencies much more suppressed or articulate. Okay, now I'm going to just give a very quick example of some ways that uh, Soothe can be used in extreme. Lately, I've been do using it as an alternative to things like uh, low-pass envelope filters and various things like that. It doesn't quite do the same thing. It takes on a life of its own. And this is just one example of some of the uh, extremes in which it can produce and everything. It's really something that should be explored and tried in, in various different instruments. This is it across the entire drum kit. Uh, it will sound extremely different across different loops um, and then across vocals and lots of different uh, things that can be used to um, try and create really ridiculous sounds and uh, subtle sounds and all in between. Here goes. <laughs> 